Yeah, I got the pants on. Today. You can have a mutual agreement to get out of a purchase agreement. Remember, we can do anything we want as long as it's legal. So if a buyer says, hey, I've decided that we're not going to move to, and the seller says, well, we found a better buyer. Let's agree to get out of this purchase agreement. You can do that. It's mutual. You can do anything as long as you both agree. And then there's operations of law that will kill a contract. Bankruptcy, divorce, things of that nature could kill contracts. Thumbs up. All right, cool. On page 194, there's a whole bunch of other things that deals talked about forms we use. There's no question on the exam that's going to ask you name six forms in the real estate industry. All right. Over on page 195, there's the offer and the counter offer that we have talked about. Page 196 talks about the word acceptance. We went through all of that. Both sides have to know. Then the next thing there on page 196 is this thing called a binder. All right. I absolutely hate this word. So in your book, I want you to write the words letter of intent. Letter of intent. The slang for this is LOI. That's what you will hear us mainly use. It's a letter of intent to make an offer. All right. It is not used by us real estate agents because we have an attorney that has already written us an offer form and a counter offer form. The letter of intent is mainly used in the commercial world or between investors that typically don't have an agent involved. All right. Another word for this that you should write down is sometimes this is called a short form purchase agreement. Short form. So here's what it is. In the commercial world, purchase agreements are very specific to every property because there's different environmental issues, there's different zoning issues, there's all kinds of financing that's different. <clears throat> so a purchase agreement is written every time for a commercial transaction. Unlike us that use the IARs form, and I told you before, it's just blanks we fill in, it's the same purchase agreement. In the commercial world, it's different. So here's the problem. You can't write a purchase agreement. You're not an attorney. So you would have to go to an attorney to get a purchase agreement written. Well, that's not too bad unless there's seven counters going on. Now you've got to go back to your attorney seven times. So what an LOI is, what a letter of intent is, is a game that we play as agents that say things like, hey Ross, if I offered you 150,000 and we closed on Wednesday and you do the title work and I'll do an inspection and we're both gonna wear blue turtleneck sweatshirts, would, you, would that be acceptable to you? And Ross comes back and goes, well, if you offered us 120,000, and we wore green turtleneck sweatshirts, we, we'd accept that. So we play this game, what if, and it's typically just one page of bullet points. What if our offer's 100 grand? Close on the 30th. We'll do the environmental, split the title work, yada, yada, yada. Then what happens is once we have agreed on these bullet points, now I take those bullet points to an attorney and go, hey, 
write me one purchase agreement with these bullet points. So he writes it and I come back to Ross and I'm like, hey, Ross, here's our offer. And we offer it to him and Ross goes, hey, we'll take that. Well, of course, because we pre-negotiated all of the terms in this letter of intent, which is an intent to make an offer. All right. It's not an actual offer. That's why binder is such a crappy word, because the LOI is not binding. I could come back to Ross with that offer and go, here's our offer. And Ross goes, no, we changed our mind. But, but, but you signed the doesn't matter. It's not binding. It's just a set of bullet points. It's not a contract because as agents, we can't write a contract. It's a letter of intent to make an offer. And once we agree on the terms, then we'll write the real offer and send it to you. Thumbs up. Now, earnest money. Earnest money is a deposit by the buyer to show his earnest in buying the property. Is earnest money required? The answer is no. There is no law that requires earnest money in the state of Indiana. Now it makes sense and your job as the listing agent is to get the most earnest money from the buyer as you can. Your job as the selling agent is to pay the least amount of earnest money as you can. Earnest money is a term inside of the contract that we can negotiate. For example, when we bought this house here that we live in, we offered up, I think, $1,000 for earnest money. When they counter back, they only countered two things. They wanted $2,500 and they wanted a closing date different than we wanted. So it is a term that can be negotiated, but that money is the buyer's money. Earnest money is a credit to the buyer. All right. And it will count as his money when he closes. So if he puts $5,000 down on a $200,000 house, he, the rest, the, the balance is 195 because that five counts as his money. It counts towards the purchase price. That money is held by typically one of two people. 90% of the time it's held by the listing broker. You write an offer to me, your buyer's earnest money is going to go into my earnest money bank account. All right. The other place it could be held is a title company where we say, hey, we're going to have Chicago title hold the earnest money, some neutral third party. All right. Now, there's a couple things we need to talk about. So let's flip over here real quick. I have two bank accounts. Most brokerages have two bank accounts. They have an earnest money account, and then we have a general bank account. The earnest money account is only for clients, buyers, earnest money to go in. I can only put earnest money in there. Something happens either intentionally or by accident, and I put a client's money into here. That is called commingling. 
I have commingled other people's money with my money. All right. Now, here's the problem with commingling. Typically, it's done by accident. I put the wrong deposit slip. I wasn't paying attention and I put the earnest money into my general account. And then out of my general account, I go pay my electric bill. That's a light bulb. Now, what I'm guilty of is called conversion. I've converted someone else's money into mine and used it for something. I paid rent, I paid a commission to one of my agents, I took the money out of my paycheck, anything I want or anything that I use it for because we don't know which dollar's which. So I typically get in trouble for both of these because you commingle, then you convert because you didn't realize you put someone's earnest money in your general account. Now, if you put someone's money into your account and you see that you did, oh shit, you got back to the office and went, oh, that's the wrong deposit. So I'm, you go back to the bank and move it back over here to earnest money. You still are guilty of commingling. You can't untake it out. All right. So that's still commingling. All right. So commingling is when I put earnest money into my general account. Then I spend money out of my general account. I get caught for conversion. All right. Cool.